Good morning, church. Good morning. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. If you are visiting with us, we are very pleased that you're here, and we want you to feel right at home, and we want to get to know you. We appreciate you coming, and we want to uh, be of service to you any way we can, and especially if you're looking for an, our church home, we'd like you to please give us an opportunity. There's a visitor card in the pew, and uh, we'd like to stay in touch with you or answer any questions if we can. So please fill out one of those. Thank you for being here today. Uh, our, we have several announcements that I'd call your attention to in your bulletin on the, the last pages, page 9. Uh, let me call your attention to the fact that there will be an informational meeting following worship this morning. I thought I was on. Am I not on? Will we get double trouble this way? No, you're fine. Um, so there's an informational meeting that follows. We are, uh, the, our elders are going to discuss our annual budget, and uh, you don't have to be a member to attend that, but uh, that will be a fascinating and a very important meeting, I'm sure, as much as we all love money. So please, uh, please join us there. There are announcements about uh, Sunday services, about the ministry of Heart to Heart. We have a need for Sunday school teachers and uh, nursery workers with our young children. And uh, an update on the pulpit committee is always available by email if you, if you uh, are concerned about that, interested in that. Let's turn our hearts to the Lord. Let's still our hearts and uh, approach the Lord using the invocation on page two and the, and the prayer. I'll give thanks to the Lord, call on his name, make known his deeds among the peoples, sing to him, sing praises to him, tell of his wonderful works, glory in his holy name. Let us pray together. Oh, oh Father, Father, most, most high, high, whose, whose dwelling, dwelling place, place is beyond the heavens, heavens. O oh Lord, incomparable, far beyond our loftiest thoughts, gather us together in the name of Jesus, whom the angels adore as the Son of Most High, for his name is above every name. Lead us in our worship, that, that all we do might be undertaken at your bidding, fulfilled with your grace, directed by your wisdom, informed by your truth, and accomplished by your glory. Through Christ our Lord, whom with you and the Holy Spirit, O Father, we constantly bless and glorify, our eternal God, age after age. Amen. Won't you stand, please? And read with me responsibly our call to worship. The earth quakes before them, the heavens tremble. The sun and the moon are darkened, and the stars withdraw their shining. The Lord utters his voice before his army, for his camp is exceedingly great. He who executes his word is powerful. For the day of the Lord is great and very awesome. Who can endure it? Let us sing to the Lord, holy, holy, holy. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, early in the morning my song shall rise to Thee. Full and mighty God in three persons, blessed Trinity, holy, 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 all the saints adore thee, casting down. Around the glass. 
gospel, the church is one. We do not walk alone. We have his spirit as we press on to lead us safely home. Old story that rescued me. Praise to my Savior, the King of life. I stand in the gospel of Jesus. And when in glory, and when in glory, still I will sing of this old story that rescued me. Praise to my Savior, the King. Of life, I stand in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Praise to my Savior, the King of life. I stand in the gospel of Jesus Christ. I stand in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever wilt be. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Summer and winter and springtime and harvest, sun, moon, and stars in their courses above. Join with all nature in manifold witness to thy great faithfulness, mercy, and love. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness, morning by morning, new mercies I see. seated. From our shorter catechism, we read questions 23 and 24. 
what offices doth Christ execute as our Redeemer? Christ, as our Redeemer, executeth the offices of a prophet, of a priest, and of a king, both in his estate of humiliation and exaltation. How doth Christ execute the office of a prophet? Christ executeth the office of a prophet in revealing to us by his word and spirit the will of God for our salvation. Throughout the whole Old Testament, the leaders of God's people are prophets, priests, and kings. Those figures are sometimes far short of what they ought to be, and sometimes they're very noble and admirable and very powerful in the things of God. At their best, each of those offices represents what the Savior is going to be when he comes. And throughout the Old Testament, no single person ever fulfills all three offices. Only Christ is prophet, priest, and king. Ministry of worship, ministry of intercession, and the ministry of rule and reign. From the New Testament, we read Acts chapter 7, verses 49 to 53. Heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. What kind of house will you build for me, says the Lord? Or what is the place of my rest? Did not my hand make all these things? You stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit. As your fathers did, so do you. Which of the... Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who announced beforehand the coming of the righteous one, whom you have now betrayed and murdered, you who received the law as delivered by angels and did not keep it. So far, the word of God. Please pray with me. We come to our time of intercession. Please join me in prayer. Our Father and our God, we give you our grateful praise as we have sung. All good things have come from your hand, and in your rule and in your reign, everything is, everything is dispensed according to your perfect will. Nothing in our lives is out of control, and from your hand we've been richly blessed. You have treated us beyond anything we could ever deserve because of the Lord Jesus and his goodness to bring us back to your, to your family. Please receive our thanks. Father, to be here today, we, we think of our brothers and sisters who have uh, been afflicted with suffering and with sickness. We pray, Father, for, for uh, Justin Howell, a man who is new to our congregation, but uh, has been hospitalized for four days and is now home. We pray that you would, your healing grace would be upon him and, and he and his wife Zoe, concerned for the, 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 the due date, the coming of their first child. We pray, Lord, that you would be with Zoe and that you would give Justin uh, the strength that he will need to be up and about and to help Zoe in the time of delivery. We're thankful for your mercies to Laura Rapon to Lily Sumner and her mother, Jessie, to the Olsons. Father, we pray that your mercies would be uh, abundant for each of these according to their needs. We thank you for them and for their, their place in our lives as brothers and sisters in Christ. We pray for our Marines who are deployed, John Taylor and uh, Mason Sheffield, Father, we pray for Mason as he especially is uh, anticipating his wedding to Macy in March. Father, please uh, bless that couple. Thank you for them. It's faithfully uh, fulfilling all the roles of the family there at home. Father, we pray for the Beachy families in the in, for Grant in the loss of his mother, we pray especially for his dad, Stan, that you would comfort him with the consolation of Christ. 
We pray in thanksgiving for our pulpit committee. We ask, Lord, your richest blessings on them in the pastoral search process. It's uh, quite demanding and quite uh, time-consuming. Thank you for their faithfulness. And we pray, Lord, that you would bless their labors and that you would lead us in your time and in your way to the man who will be called as our next pastor. We trust, Lord, that your blessings are upon him and that you're going to lead us to him in your time. We pray in thanksgiving for our officers, our elders and deacons. We pray, Lord, for the, the meeting that will follow this worship service, that you will help us as a congregation to see and to uh, understand some of the issues they deal with and for the good of our church. And we pray that you would bless them and receive our thanks for them and for their service. Father, please bless the preaching of your word this morning. Bless Eric as he comes and, and uh, breaks the word of God to us. We pray, Lord, that you would bless his, his labors. We're grateful for him and for his faithfulness and for his family. We pray, Father, that you would bless the remainder of our worship and that you would build us up in Christ. These things we ask in your holy name, Father, Son, and Spirit. Amen. At this time, we'll receive our morning offering. Please stand for our song of preparation, The God of Abraham Praise. I on his oath depend, 
I shall on eagle's wings upborne to heaven ascend. I shall behold his face, I shall his power adore, and sing the wonders of his grace forevermore. A goodly land I see, with peace and plenty blessed, a land of sacred liberty and endless rest. Their milk and honey flow, and oil and wine abound, and trees of life forever grow with mercy. the Lord our King, the Lord our righteousness, triumphant o'er the world and sin, the Prince of Peace. On Zion's sacred height, his kingdom he maintains. And glorious with his saints in light forever reigns. The whole triumphant host gives thanks to God on high. Hail, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, they ever cry. Hail, Abram's God in mine, I join the heavenly lays. All might and majesty are thine and endless praise. You may take your seats. Good morning. It's good to see all of you here. It's a good group. I ha I'm going to take care of two quick business items, if you don't mind. Um, I promised Alina that I would make the announcement about the women's study. This sheet is in the foyer. Find one of these. Um, there's Tuesday evening study and a Wednesday one. So find these out there. Sign up. See Alina for more, um, more details if you have questions about that. Um, and I just want to remind you again at the, of the uh, meeting, the informational meeting we're going to have just to present the budget. This is not a vote. We're just presenting that to you. We'll take a five-minute break at the end of our worship service, so the end will be obvious. Take five minutes. Um, I, I would ask that you respect the uh, nursery workers, so grab your kids maybe and, and come back for that business uh, meeting for that announcement. It shouldn't take us long at all. We just want to make sure that you have that information in front of you. Turning your Bibles to Malachi chapter 3. We're actually going to start in 2.17 again and read through chapter 3, verse 7. I want you to make note of two questions as we begin. Maybe write these down, just so you'll remember to go back to them at the end. The first question I want you to ask is, how did you come to worship this morning? Don't be too literal in that. How did you come to worship? What's your heart as you come to worship this morning? And then the second question I want you to ask or write down is, why did you come to worship this morning? So make note of those if you would, and we're going to turn back to those at the end. So if you'll turn with me in your Bibles, if you haven't already, Malachi chapter 2. I'll begin reading in verse 17 of chapter 2, and we'll read through chapter 3, verse 7. You have wearied the Lord with your words, but you say... How have we wearied him? By saying everyone who does evil is good in the sight of the Lord and he delights in them. Or by asking, where is the God of justice? Behold, I send my messenger and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. And the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming and who can stand when he appears? 
For he's like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver, and they will bring offerings in righteousness to the Lord. Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to the Lord, as in the days of old and as in former years. Then I will draw near to you for judgment. I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers, against the adulterers, against those who swear falsely, against those who oppress the hired worker in his wages, the widow and the fatherless, against those who thrust aside the sojourner and do not fear me, says the Lord of hosts. For I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore, you, O children of Jacob, are not consumed. For the days of your fathers, you have turned us from the days of your fathers, you have turned aside from my statutes and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. Let's pray together. Father, as we prayed earlier today, we come before you as an offering. We present ourselves before you as an offering. And we're mindful of our sin and our shortcomings. And we also are aware of your faithfulness and your love and your mercy and your grace. And so we ask you to make something of our offering. Make it into something that is a sweet aroma to you. Make it into something that shines brightly and demonstrates the gospel of Jesus Christ in whom and in whom alone there is salvation. May we worship you aright. May you be honored in this time. In Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You remember in chapter 2, verse 17, that the people made their accusations against God. And you'll also remember that this is the process in the book of Malachi, these disputations, these conversations, if you will, but argumentative on the part of the people as they go before God and they accuse God, they accuse God of his failings, of his shortcomings. And even as God professes again and then proves his love, the people resist and the people challenge him. They call him by other names. That is to say, they give to him attributes that are not his, that are the attributes of fallen, failed humans. And they remove from him the We said that the accusations in verse 17 again were, as God says that he's weary of the voices, the words of the people, those accusations were everyone who does evil is good in the sight of the Lord and he delights in them or they ask where is the justice of God where is God's justice and we said there are two ways to look at this this could be cynical questions it could be that the people are looking at the world around them and saying the world around us is prospering it's successful God certainly you delight in those other nations but what about us what have you done for us or the people, in, at the end of this, where is the God of justice? They could be asking, God, where is your justice? Why haven't you dealt fairly with us? Why haven't you dealt according to your covenant promises to us? This is a dangerous place to be, and we find ourselves in the same place in our own lives where we are calling out God for not acting the way that we think God should act, as opposed to knowing who God is in his word and submitting to that. When we go to God, are we asking him based on what he's already told and demonstrated to be true about himself, or are we asking those things that we feel, we think, even in our fallen nature, that we think holy God should be doing? So those are the two charges that we have from the people against God. God, you're not holy, that is, you don't hate sin, really. And God, you're not just, you're not dealing with us fairly. In Deuteronomy 32, verse 4, we read, The rock, his work is perfect, for all his ways are justice. A God of faithfulness and without iniquity, just and upright is he. But the people resist, the people here challenge that reality, the truth of who God is. And so God responds here. It's interesting, I think, in reading these verses in chapter 3, we can hear, I think, I think fairly, 
we can hear the tenor of these comments to be almost as cynical or at least as ironic as the comments of the people are. And so we see in chapter 3, the response is, Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. Now think about that. Who's the Lord that the people seek? Who is it that the people are asking for? What is it that they're looking for? They're looking for the God to come who's going to be just and fair to us at the expense of the nations that are around them. They're saying, God, deal with us favorably. Restore to us that glory, perhaps, that grandeur that we knew, and eliminate the threat of the people. We spent one Sunday morning at length covering the history of the people of Israel. And you'll remember here, these are people that have been in captivity and are back. I keep coming back to that because it's significant. They were carried into captivity because of their sin. The just and holy God had judged the people. He had caused them, not just let them wander, caused them to be taken away in captivity in Babylon. And he held them there until an appointed time that he determined to bring them back into the land that he promised. This is the God of covenant. This is his covenant promise. If you obey me, he says to his people, then you will have. And he lists the promises included in that promise was this land, this place. And so we have people that are living out the very fulfillment of the covenant promise of God that are accusing God of not being just, of not being fair, and certainly of not being holy. holy. And so God says, behold. That word behold we'll see repeated here. It's this idea. Look. Pay attention. I'm going to show you who I am. All those things you think you were asking for, all those things you say you want, it's coming. It's coming in my timing. And the tenor here is, and you're not really going to like it. It's not going to be what you think you want. It's not going to be what you think it should be. Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come into his temple. So there's two messengers, really, that are sent out that we read in chapter 3. So we have the first messenger. Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. We see these same words. I mentioned this last week. They're quoted in Matthew 11, verse 10, in Mark 1, verse 2, and in Luke 7, 27. Each time these words speak directly to John the Baptist, the coming of the prophet, the messenger of John the Baptist. In Matthew 11, verses 10 and 11, we read, This is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. Truly I say to you, among those born of women, there is risen no one greater than John the Baptist. Yet the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. As we go on through Malachi, Malachi 4, 5, we read, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. That same verse, Malachi 4, 5, is quoted in Luke 1, 17 as the announcement of the birth of John the Baptist. So this first messenger, we're looking forward to John the Baptist. Now remember, if you followed us through our Advent series, we know that there's a 400-year time span so when we read in scripture, behold, this is what I'm doing, that doesn't mean this is what I'm doing right now. This is God's timing. So we have a prophetic statement, a prophet prophesying of a prophet to come, and that prophet, John the Baptist. So let's look for a minute at the ministry of John the Baptist to understand what's happening as we go through chapter 3. Think about what you know to be true about John the Baptist and his work. We know that he was a herald for Jesus Christ, and this is culturally um, common. It was in the days of Malachi and before. It was still common in the days of, of John the Baptist and as Christ walked on the earth, that a herald would go before the king or before the ruler and make the way straight, clear the path, announce his coming. There would be 
a parade of exaltation, of celebration. The king is on his way. And so we think of that, I, I, I believe we would tend to think of that as a celebratory time. But think about John the Baptist and his ministry. In Mark chapter 1, verses 4 and 5, we read the following. John appeared, baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea and Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. So the people, the Jewish people of Judea and Jerusalem were being called to repentance. Their sins, their personal sins, and even their national sins were being called out. This is not the typical picture we see of the royal, um, the, the royal parade, the royal procession of just horns and music and celebration. As John comes as a herald of Jesus who would follow, he's calling the people to account. And these are your sins. Confess and repent. That's not the messenger the people in Malachi's day, the people before Malachi wanted to hear. They're very good, very clear on God judging the nations. Where's that God? Where's the God that likes us and hates them? But what they're getting, what they're receiving is a bold proclamation of the holiness of God and their need to repent, their need to confess their sin, their need to be made right. It's interesting, I think, that John is not preaching as he comes to the evils of Roman occupation. He certainly does speak to nobility in his day. He calls the king to account for his sin. He loses his life ultimately because of that, but his primary focus is the repentance, the restoration of the people and their individual sin, not the nation, but God's people initially. And so as he comes as a herald and as he comes as a messenger, that's what he's coming to do. I wonder if we think if we think sometimes about the, the, or the Jewish people in the days of Christ and we begin to shape what we think they were like based on everything we've heard in sermons in Sunday school, I think we have this picture of a unique time in Jewish history where the people all of a sudden didn't understand the Messiah. We tend to present it like that. So we have this picture of the Old Testament is pointing to Jesus Christ, right and true. And that the people are looking forward to this Messiah to come for salvation. That's absolutely true. That's the call. What we miss is the failing of the people constantly in the Old Testament to understand what that messianic promise ultimately is. And we see and hear people that are rejecting that. And so when we look at the people in the day of Malachi and we look at the people in the day of Christ, as he walks the earth, their hearts are very similar. If I was to ask you, what did the people want in Jerusalem at the coming of Christ? And those of you that have been in Sunday school or church for any time period would say, they wanted a human Messiah or they wanted deliverance at least from their human oppression. That was their heart. And so many in that thinking missed the work of Christ. That same is true at the time of Malachi where they're calling already at this point for some sort of human interdiction whereby they can live as the prominent and the dominant people. Where they can look down on the rest of the world, on the other peoples. Because they are blessed by God, they're his people. But when John comes as the messenger, that's not the message he brings. His center of ministry, if you will, was pointing out the sin of the people, calling God's people to repentance. And in doing this, he rightly prepared 
the way of the Messiah. We read on, Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. Do you like surprises? There's different people. Some people really like surprises. They like things to happen suddenly and unexpectedly. When we see this word in scripture, however, it's never a good thing. The phrase here is not of something that is good and about to happen. It's not a surprise party. Every time the word that's translated will suddenly come, every time we see that in the Old Testament, it is something that's, um, it's a calamity that's coming. It's a judgment that's coming. It's something that's painful, that's challenging, and often, most often, it refers to the judgment of God. So as God is responding to the people and they're asking, where is this God of justice? We want the God of justice. Send him on to us. We read that the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple and the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. Remember that phrase, the Lord of hosts refers to the Lord and his armies, his heavenly armies. It's a military picture. This is not the justice God toward Israel that they're thinking. I'm sure they're excited to think of God coming in judgment of the world, but that's not the context here. He's coming to his people, and he will suddenly fill his temple. This is the same temple, by the way, that we read in earlier chapters where worship has been corrupted, where sacrifices have been corrupted, the blemished are offered, in violation of God's requirement. The priests are dealing with judicial context as they rule among the people. The temple has been perverted, but Christ is coming and he will fill the temple. There will be holiness in the presence of the people and the people will have to, from their corrupt hearts, look on infinite holy God who comes in justice, who comes in judgment. How do we know that we're speaking of Christ? Look at how this messenger is described. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. So there's a Lord reference. The messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. We read on in verse 2. But who can endure the day of his coming and who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver, and they will bring offerings in righteousness to the Lord. That word Lord that's used, the Lord whom you seek, is Adon. It's not typically a word by itself that's used to speak of God. Elsewhere, when we read the Lord so early, sometimes we'll say as Jehovah this is the infinite self-existing God when we get though to verse 1 we read the Lord whom you seek that V is a definite article so it's not just a Lord or some Lord it is the Lord this is significant because there's a distinction between the Lord referenced earlier and the Lord referenced here and it's a designation for Christ the Messiah, the Lord whom you seek. And again, the people don't even know who it is they're really seeking. They're asking in ignorance for this justice, for this God who's holy, and they're not even clear on what it is they're asking. And so, again, an almost ironic response here. It's the Lord whom you seek. You don't even understand who he is. That's who's coming. That's who will fill the temple. And he is the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Think about who Jesus the Christ is. He's the satisfaction of every covenant that we see in the Old Testament moving forward. And he. All of those find their fulfillment 
in Jesus Christ alone. There is salvation in no one else because there is satisfaction. There is no other satisfaction for the covenants than Christ Jesus himself. If we were to look at Colossians 1.19, we would be more convinced of this. Speaking of Christ, we read, For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. This is Jesus Christ, the Messiah. In Colossians 2, verses 9 and 10, Jesus is described thusly. For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you have been filled in him, who is the head of all rule and authority. That's the Jesus that we speak of in the Bible. I know this is not um, necessarily always a popular picture of Jesus in this day. But as Jesus comes in love, absolutely, in sacrifice, absolutely, to seek and to save the lost, absolutely true, he comes as holy, just God, the righteous judge. And suddenly, he will fill the temple. Jeremiah 33, 14 and 15. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will fulfill the promise I made to the house of Israel and the house of Judah in those days. And at that time, I will cause a righteous branch to spring up for David, and he shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. That's Jesus Christ, the Messiah. I, I debated whether to do this, but we're, we're going we're to do it anyway. Turning your Bibles to Revelation, if you have your Bible or Bible app, turn to Revelation 19. I, I just want you to, to just listen and hear who our Savior is. And I understand there's figurative language in Revelation, and we can't expound on all of this, but just read these words, and I encourage you, go back to them this afternoon. Go back to them as you study this week. So Revelation 19, beginning in verse 11, then I saw heaven opened and behold a white horse. The one sitting on it is called faithful and true and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire and on his head are many diadems and he has a name written that no God and the armies of heaven arrayed in fine linen, white, pure, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Flip over to chapter 20. Reading in verse 11. Then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it for his presence earth and sky, excuse me from his presence earth and sky fled away and no place was found for them and i saw the dead great and small standing before the throne and books were opened then another book was opened which is the book of life and the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done and the sea gave up the dead who were in it Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. The people want justice, they say. And we're going to get justice. We get a justice cry in our culture every day. We cry out in our own lives most days. It's not fair. It's not just. Be just to me. What we've just read is a picture of God's justice, his holiness, the standard of perfection. We read in our, in our reading already in the service from Joel chapter 2, Verse 11, for the day of the Lord is great and very awesome. Who can endure it? In Joel chapter 2, if we were to read down just a bit further, beginning in verse 31, we would read, the sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. 
verse 32, and it shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Do you see that? Do you understand a little bit of the depths of our depravity? Do you hear a little bit the petty whining of the people in the day of Malachi and perhaps our own petty whining? Do you see what lies ahead for those who do not call upon the name of the Lord, who reject the sacrifice of Christ? It's hell, eternally, suffering. So great is God's holiness and so great is our rebellion that we see so great a punishment. And the only hope, the only hope, is calling on the name of Jesus Christ. We read on and we begin to see the mercy, even though I'm not convinced the people of the day see this. We read in verse 2, but who can endure the day of his coming and who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. Those are two different pictures of metallurgy and the refinement and then scrubbing clean on the surface. So both of them end with purification of something. It's a beautiful picture because it's not destruction of something. God comes to his people and he comes to judge them to be sure. But he leads with refining. He leads with cleansing. He leads with purifying his people. For he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. And he will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver. The sons of Levi are who? The priests. He begins with the leadership. It's the priest in the preceding chapter that are leading in the corruption of worship that are not only tolerating, but are encouraging faulty and flawed worship. If we were to back up a little ahead of the days of Malachi, we would see where the priests, after the temple is rebuilt, the walls are restored, and the priests begin worship, that they eventually just wander off into the fields to farm and plant. Temple worship is abandoned. The people aren't coming and worshiping, and the priests have left their posts into the field, and so they're being called back to the temple and not just to worship, not just to show up, but to show up and worship in the way that God requires. And so as God comes to purify and he comes to refine, he begins with the sons of Levi. How do we know that they're purified? How do we know that their repentance is full, that their confession is right? Look at the progression here. We see the messenger comes. This messenger is Christ. We see that it's the leadership that's purified. And then the result of purification is they will bring offerings in righteousness to the Lord. This is an important check for us in our lives. It's been heavy on my heart and mind this morning and coming to this passage of Scripture. How do we know that my confession is sincere? How do I know that I am honest in my repentance, that I'm seeking Christ as I should? We know by our worship. We know by how we come to worship. We know by who we are in worship. If we read on in verse 4, then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to the Lord as in the days of old and as in former years. The result of sincere and honest confession and repentance will always be worship. It will always be right worship. We live in a day and age, I think, where church attendance and body participation is like any other thing in our list. And I'm not just blasting you guys, I am preaching to myself where this is just another thing we can do out of all the things that we could possibly be doing. And that's sinful, rebellious worship. 
But if we are faithful in our confession and repentance, if we are seeking God, that will be demonstrated in our worship, in a heart for worship, in a desire to proclaim the infinite worth of God as we come together corporately, as I live my life, as you live your life, individually and personally. There's a distinction here, a transition as we move from verse 4 into verse 5. In verse 5 we see, then I will draw near to you for judgment. I will be a swift witness against sorcerers, against the adulterers, against those who swear falsely, against those who oppress the hired worker in his wages, the, wind, the widow of the fa- and the fatherless, against those who thrust aside the sojourner and do not fear me, says the Lord of hosts. I think we have two pictures here. Through verse 4, we have this picture of discipline. It's a good and godly picture. We know whom the Lord loves, he disciplines. What's the distinction between discipline and punishment? We spoke to this a little bit last week, but not in its fullness. The heart of discipline is repentance and restoration. That's the heart of God's discipline in the lives of his children. Repentance, restoration. Restoration is right worship. That we are where we should be. That we are seeing God as we should be. And as we sin, we must. We need to confess again, repent again. Seek God again. Draw near to God again. And because, as we read in verse 6, for I, the Lord, do not change, we know he's there as we confess and repent and return to him. Our sin interrupts our worship. And that confession, repentance, is a restoration of that same worship. It's interesting to note, I think, in 1 John 1, 7, John writing makes clear that ultimately, and we should remember this, the blood of Jesus, his son, that is God's son, cleanses us from all sin. Even in this, it's the blood of Christ that we appeal to in our confession. So there's discipline, and then in verse 5, there's punishment. Then I will draw near to you for judgment, and I will be a swift witness against who? The unrepentant. Those that are not the children of God. Those that are outside of the kingdom of God. Those who have not called upon the name of Jesus Christ to be saved. So Jesus in his coming refines his people and then judges those who resist and rebel. John Piper writes this of punishment. It's holy and just retribution and it is eternal Therefore, it's not designed for rehabilitation. It displays God's justice, and it highlights how valuable mercy is to those who receive it. So again, I ask you, what do we do with this? What do we do with this text in front of us? We spoke of this last week, verse 7. Return to me, and I will return to you. From the days of your fathers, you have turned aside from my statutes and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. We read that in the New Testament in James chapter 4, verses 8 through 10. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched, and mourn, and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you. And in Zechariah 1.4, do not be like your fathers to whom the former prophets cried out. Thus says the Lord of hosts, "Return return from your evil ways and from your evil deeds. But they did not hear or pay attention to me, declares the Lord. And lastly, and I hope this reflects my heart this morning, Peter preaching at Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, and with many other words, he bore witness and continued exhorting them, saying, save yourselves from this crooked generation. 
So as we close, I want you to think back to those questions that we asked from the beginning. How did you come to worship this morning? I'm asking myself that. How did I come to worship this morning? What was my heart in coming to worship? Am I checking the box? Am I satisfying someone else in my family? Is it tradition or custom or by rote? How did I come? And then why? Why be here? Why come at all? Let me tell you, the answer to both of those, the right answer to both of those is Jesus Christ. How did I come to seek Christ? To be with Christ, to be with the body of Christ, for the sake of Christ, to the glory of Christ, because he deserves worship as he demands in his word. And what's the goal of my coming? It's Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is our reward. He's the prize. That's it. It gets no higher. Look, the people of Malachi's day were looking for all the benefits of being the people of God. What do we get with that? We get this great new land. It flows with milk and honey. We get to be the big dog. All the nations in the world look to us. Think of, think of the nation in the glory of Solomon. David, the warrior king, and Solomon just kind of sitting on the golden couch as the world came to the, to the steps of Jerusalem. Wise and wonderful. And the people are longing for all those ancillary benefits of being in Christ without looking to Christ, of being the people of God without pursuing God, without wanting to know God, without wanting to grow in God. It is our heart as leaders at Harvest that everything we do here has this goal. When we get together in the evening tonight and we work through the Westminster Confession, it's not to pass an exam. It's not so you can answer the questions. It's not just so that we can know all the stuff that good Presbyterians are supposed to know. It's because in knowing that, we see God. We understand God in ways that we don't already. All of those things point back to the Word of God so that we might fully know God. We don't pray to get things. That's not the end goal. Certainly we ask God for things. We should, rightly. But the goal of prayer, even in prayer itself, is to know God. It's intimacy with God. It's to be changed by being in the very presence of God. Prayer for the sake of prayer is pointless. Prayer in the presence of infinite holy God is of infinite value. There are so many other things. Why do we give? Why do we read our Bibles? Because God will give me a good day. I'll get the promotion. I'll. It's silliness. The beginning and end of the Christian life is God. It's Christ. It's Christ who saves us. It's Christ who intercedes for us. It's Christ who works in our sanctification. It's the image of Christ to which we are being conformed day by day as we walk in this life. And it is Christ that will be the prize at the end. And there is nothing else. We're lost in seeking anything to either side of that. How did you come to worship today? Why are you here? And then what are you going to do? Let's pray together. Father, we as a people confess our sin. I say that for me personally, and I say that for this body. We see in your word something of your holiness. We don't appreciate it fully. We can't appreciate it fully. But we see enough to know 
that you are infinitely holy and we are not. And even in Christ, even those of us that are saved by your sovereign work through the blood of Christ, struggle in sin, long for sin, and so we confess. We know our sin interferes, it interrupts with right worship. It interferes with intimacy with you, with knowing you, with hearing from you. As we regard iniquity, as we regard sin in our hearts. And we confess. And we do always celebrate that there is salvation in Jesus Christ because otherwise we would be without hope. We would be lost. And so we praise you and thank you for that. And as we come to the Lord's table, this meal, this covenant meal, and we consider the body and blood of Christ Jesus broken and poured out for us. And we confess our sin for which you stood condemned willingly. And we should be crying out in gratitude for the righteousness that you give to us. God, you are just and holy and in that the penalty was paid by Christ. Your wrath poured out and then assuaged in Jesus Christ. Convict us of our sin, call us to repentance, restore us to right worship, and then send us so that everywhere we go, everywhere we go today as we see people and we know that there are those that are condemned, that we would be the voice of life and hope, instructing all that we meet, that if you call upon the name of the Lord, you will be saved. And it is in Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen. From 1 Corinthians chapter 11, hear the words of the institution of the Lord's Supper. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body which is for you, do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. This is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. But if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we're disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. So then, my brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, so that when you come together, it will not be for judgment. Please pray with me. Father, we ask that you would set apart these elements for our worship, for your glorification, for our edification, for our nourishment and enrichment in Christ. These things we ask 
Father, Son, Holy Spirit, for your sake and in faith in you. Amen. When we eat and drink, when we take in food, we are nourished by it. It's digested. The nutritional value of it is communicated to our bodies. And we're able to live. We're able to work. We're able to move. We're able to think. For you to be a Christian, Christ has to be in you. He has to nourish you, strengthen you, enable you. Writing to the Ephesians, Paul said, For by grace you are saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God. It's not your working, it's not, it's not you yourself that made yourself a Christian by believing. Your faith, your connection to Christ is a gift of God. But that faith in Christ then leads you to be his workmanship. Paul says, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, as our preacher communicated. Everywhere we go, everything we do, our concern is to glorify God, to serve him, and to do his will and his work. One day Christ fed 5,000 people, and they were so excited about the food that they wanted to make him king, they misunderstood. And Christ said, you seek me because you ate of the bread and filled your belly. But the food of Christ is much more profound than that. Much more profound. There's, there's food here that is not bread. Man shall not live by bread alone. And that's what this is. This is bread alone. But beyond this, is the reality of our Savior living, slain like a lamb on our behalf, seated at the right hand of God, reigning forever. So we come to the table at his command and and we look to him and we feast upon him that he would nourish us and strengthen us and make us to be his people, able to serve him, to be participants in building his kingdom, to do good for others to be about his business by his strength. Christ is our savior and we come to him. We don't come to the table to receive the food. We come for what is beyond the table, above the table, what is truly real, what is truly real, we come to him. If you trust Christ as your savior, you're welcome at this table. If you're a stranger to Christ, please wait and come another day when Christ lives in you and you can feast upon him. It's our custom, elders, please come. It's our custom to come down these side aisles and to partake of the elements. There's gluten-free wafers here if you need those. Uh, the, the rings of, of juice on the outer ring is fermented wine and the, the cups in the inner rings are... Um, unfermented wine. You come when you're ready.
Our closing song is from the hymnal. So find your red hymnals and turn to 660. Oh God, beyond all praising. Please stand. Beyond all praising, we worship you today and sing the love amazing that songs cannot repay. For we can only wonder at every gift you send and blessings without number. Upon your word, we honor and adore you, our great and mighty Lord. Then hear, O oh gracious Savior, accept the love we bring, and we who know your favor may serve you as our King. Congregation of the Lord Jesus Christ, receive the Lord's benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace now and forever through Jesus Christ, our King and our Savior. Amen. Briefly dismissed, and we'll see you back here in just a moment. Just a reminder. To